All right, 2 Timothy chapter, there we go, 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2 is where we'll be this evening. Let me go ahead and get one thing right out of the way before we start this message this evening is that I know we are taught that we should serve God, you know, no matter what, I'm for that, but the fact of the matter is when you serve God, there is rewards for serving God. There is, there is benefits for serving God. So let's go ahead and make that clear that God doesn't mind that. God knew that he would, if he told us about hell and heaven, it would help motivate us for salvation, right? They don't bother God to do that. And as a parent, sometimes it's an, it's an opportunity to teach our children the principles of, of uh, getting reward for some of their good behaviors and uh, the punishment for their not-so-good behaviors. Uh, the reward or idea system works. But the problem with America today is we have a generation now or a time of people that just they want the reward without the work and the sweat. So if you look at this verse in its absolute doctrine, if you read commentaries about this particular verse in verse 6. It says, the husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Again, if you'll notice, as I mentioned two weeks ago, that you notice God doesn't use the word vegetables in the Bible. I don't know why. He chose to use fruits because you think of the phrase of sweetness. Uh, thank God for vegetables, but uh, I mean, we know that fruits are giving that blessing. And in this past week, uh, my in-laws, my brother-in-law and my mother-in-law have homegrown gardens, and we were able to eat asparagus straight from the garden, which is a vegetable. But what my brother-in-law own has a, a lot of uh, strawberries. And uh, I have a daughter in my family. She has the same color hair as a strawberry, and she loves strawberries very much. And she, she can actually get drunk on strawberries. And uh, she, she loves strawberries. And we went out as a family and picked some strawberries. Well, I didn't go. I, had, I was, what was I doing? Oh, yeah, a bunch of trees fell down. My, so my father-in-law put me to work. That was a blessing. The, this office boy got to cut a lot of wood and haul wood. It was fun. But anyway, they went to pick strawberries. They got the easy job. And um, they were excited about it. They were excited about it. Because if you know anything about picking f- fresh strawberries. By the way, how many of you ever went to Brother McCarty's farm way back in Mexico and picked strawberries from there? Uh, you, you ate those strawberries, and you got a taste of heaven. Amen. They were just incredible strawberries. And so they picked those strawberries and made strawberry shortcake and all that good stuff. If you know anything about picking strawberries and eating strawberries, you know that it's worth your time to go out and pick them because you've had some good experiences in the past with strawberries. How many like strawberries? All right, man, almost everybody raised their hand. Here's a sign for strawberries, all right? You just put your finger and thumb, pointer and thumb together. Brother Jake said he hates these signings classes, but you all love them, amen? Can I get an amen right there? Strawberry. He didn't say he hates them, but strawberry right there, all right? Strawberry. So that's the, that's the straw. This, 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 so the point I'm trying to make here is simply this. When you know there's going to be labor involved, but there's a benefit to your labors afterwards, and you're sitting in a cool air-conditioned house eating strawberry shortcakes with a little bit of milk and homemade whatever that cake thing is and a little bit of whipped cream, and you're going to taste of heaven, you know that labor you spent in that a little while ago was, was a blessing. Now, the commentaries say this. The commentaries explain this verse like this. They say that the man that laboreth, the husbandman that worketh, he gets the first dibs on all the things that he harvests, right? Well, that makes sense. If a man's out there working and he's got crops and he's farmers throughout the years, you know, a lot of them would sell their crops for profit, for their livelihood, but they also got first dibs on their own crops. That makes sense. There's no, nobody would begrudge that. But I want you to notice biblically here, I'm going to throw out a different twist. The doctrinal, the doctrine here is this, that the man that labors gets the first pick, all right? But I want to make an application. If you read it differently, it sounds almost like this. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. What does that mean? Well, let me just say this. When you get saved, as soon as we got saved, God immediately loaded us with some fruits. He loaded us. And immediately we become partakers. of. In other words, we've experienced some beautiful fruits from God. And God begins to teach us that as we grow in grace... The fruits will continue to come along with the labor. And again, we live in a society today where the younger generation is being taught by our own government that you don't have to work for the fruits of your labor. That's not right. Somebody say, man, I'm tired of this generation that think that you can be lazy and let somebody else do all the work, and then you get to benefit from their labors. I love that bumper sticker that says, keep going to work. Millions of Americans depend on you. Amen? <laughs> Drives me crazy. It's sad to see how many... The generation of lazy people that's being raised because they don't miss, they, they miss out on this principle. But the fact is, God says, hey, I'm going to go and give you the fruits of Christianity. As soon as you get saved, you're going to experience the sweetness of salvation, the sweetness and the fruits of being a Christian. And then as you continue to labor in it, you're going to see that you get to be the first partaker of those fruits. 
So tonight I want to encourage us as Christians to realize that there is a sweet reward, a sweet satisfaction that comes with the labor for God. The Bible says here that if you labor, you have the opportunity to experience or partake of the fruit. Now, in context, it's important to see this in verse 1. The Bible says this is a, a teaching or trans, like we're supposed to transfer what we learn to the next generation. In verse 1, it says, And now therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. All right, we know that. It's important. Be strong. Verse 2, And the things which thou hast heard of me, watch this, among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou, thou therefore, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So what's the point of this message? Simply it off, it's starting it off. We want to teach the next generation that, yes, there are great benefits to serving God. There are great benefits to laboring for God. Yes, God's labor is tiring. Yes, God's labor is sometimes it, it, it's, it's energy draining. And yes, sometimes it's, you're frustrated. And yes, you will have to endure the hardness sometimes. But there's a blessing in knowing that you're serving God and doing the work of God. And God says, you keep at it. I've got a whole bunch of fruit for you at the end of the day. The strawberry shortcakes of life are waiting for you when you labor. I just want to give you three quick statements, statements tonight. Number one, God starts with the idea of rewarding with fruits. God started that. God said that when you serve him and labor for him, he's going to give us fruits. He's going to give us the opportunity at the fruits of the labors. I, uh, last week was a blessing when we went to Washington, D.C. We attended the church there. We did meet uh, Brother Wells. Attended his church on Thursday night, Brother Coons. And it was, it was a Thursday night church, which was weird. We weren't used to not being in church. On Wednesday night, we moved to Thursday night. But Wednesday evening at about 9 o'clock, me and my wife and kids sat there on the Potomac River and right outside of the Thomas Jefferson Memorial. I mean, have you seen the Thomas Jefferson Memorial before? It's amazing. The Lincoln Memorial is amazing, but there's something about that Thomas Jefferson Memorial. It's, just, it's probably one of my favorite things I saw. The Iwo Jima Memorial is, is probably my favorite thing, but just Washington, D.C. is just amazing. So we were sitting outside there as a family, the six of us, and we sat there right by the river, and we prayed for this summer's travels. It was a blessing to hear all my family pray. We start from youngest to oldest, which means Clara started and Janelle went last. But anyway, so, so we just prayed through the family. And uh, to hear my 9-year-old pray, and then my 12-year-old, and my 15-year-old, my 17-year-old, and then, of course, I prayed, and my wife prayed. We prayed and prayed, and we try to teach our kids that, listen, this summer's going to be busy. It's going to be tiring. It's going to be a lot of work. It's going to be a lot of travel. It's going to be a lot of, and then coming back here and getting busy for the weekend and just staying. It's going to be very busy. But can I tell you something, church? The fruits are amazing. And I think my children are starting to get a hold of that. Every January, I sit them down. I sit down with my family and say, uh, the invitations are coming like crazy. You want daddy to cut back? Or, and just say no to mom. My kids say, no way, daddy. We love it. As long as we keep coming to Bible Baptist Church, right? That's what they say. But, but the fact is, I want my kids to understand that the labor for God, there's fruit. Whether it's the labor we just had for Saturday Spectacular, there's fruit. The labor we have for the youth explosion, there's fruit. The labor we have for the kids' crusade, there's fruit. The labors we have for anything that happened in this church, the youth conferences, all the different things we've done through the years at this church, there is a blessing of fruit from our Heavenly Father. And God says, let me start with that. I have fruits for you if you labor. God says you're going to get the first dibs. You will get to experience the fruit. The sweetness we got at salvation just gets better and better and better and better all the time. And God started with that principle. He's teaching us a beautiful principle here that as we teach the next generation, that if you stay faithful to the things of God, there is a blessing. And it's not always a tangible thing. It's not always an actual fruit that you'll take a bite out of. It's not always something like a house or a car. But there's something in the spirit of a Christian that gives you that satisfaction, that joy, that peace, that knows you've pleased the creator of the universe. And there's something to that that sure is sweet tonight. It must be taught in our churches again today that God is a rewarder of them that are faithful. God is a rewarder of them that just stay at it. And sometimes his fruits don't come right away. Sometimes they do come right away. But the fact is God keeps track of every single little thing you do. And sometimes you sit there and you say, well, preacher, you, boy, you're going to have a whole lot of fruits because you travel. Listen, God said this in the Bible in Matthew. He says, if you gave a little cup of water to somebody, God keeps track of it. Every offering you've put in there, there's some fruit for that. Every time you encourage a little kid, there's some fruit for that. Every time you drove a van or a bus to pick up somebody and bring him to church, there's fruit for that. Every time you sat in some budget meeting, there's fruit for that. Every time you watch the nursery, there's fruit for that. Every time you watch the nursery again, there's fruit for that. Every time you work in the sound room tonight, Brother Brad's out of town. His son is up there. Talk about the next generation. Neil, everything going okay up there? Do I sound good? 
I don't look good, but I sound good. Amen. All right. So, so there's fruit for that. Every time you stand up and you sing, there's fruits for that. Every time you do something to be a blessing to somebody else, God says, I'm keeping track and the fruit's coming. Soon you'll get to sit back and enjoy that strawberry shortcake. So God starts with the fruit. We like that part. But hold on a second. Number two, we still laboreth. There's a labor. The Christian movement has got to labor again. All right, look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 6. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partake of the fruits. You want the fruits? God says, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, hold on, hold on a second. You got to work for a little bit. I've preached this message a long time ago, but I, I believe in a salvation works. Some of you might remember that message I preached a long time ago. We don't have a works salvation. You don't work for your salvation. But your salvation will compel you to work. The salvation that God gives to us will compel us to work. Whether it's to work at being a better husband, a father, a wife, a mother, a Sunday school teacher, whatever it is, whatever ministry God's given to us. And may I just say this today? There is no such thing as a big or small ministry in this church. Every bit of labor is important. It blesses my heart many Saturdays when I come in and park and go to my office and see somebody's car parked up here knowing somebody's cleaning this building and nobody's watching. Well, you don't think anybody's watching. He is. And somebody is cleaning this building. Somebody made it ready for us to come to a clean church building on a Sunday morning. We know Mrs. Fouch leads it, but many others vacuum and, and dust and clean the bathrooms. And, and boy, when you're laboring, and sometimes you don't have this pulpit, you don't have that spotlight, so to speak. And God's not that impressed with it. It's just a whole bunch of us doing the different works for God. Look, we all know this. We all know this. We see each other's faces a whole lot more than we see each other's feet, right? But thank God our feet are working today. Thank God. By the way, our feet is very, my feet are very important to my face being upright and walking and preaching and talking. And my feet are covered. They don't get seen a lot. Thank God for that. And by the way, I just read an interesting article last week that said it was a, it was a secular article. This is just free. I'll give this to you. you know, I won't charge you for this. It says men, single men that are looking for future wives, it's time to put away the flip flops. This was a secular article in the USA Today. And they said in this article, it said, men, your feet are ugly. Nobody wants to see your feet. Only wear flip-flops to the pool or in the shower. Stop showing us your toes. I said, amen. I ran upstairs and told my wife, man, the USA Today actually finally had some good sense right there. Read that, amen. I fly a lot, and I hate that you go to an airport, and there's a guy with flip-flops on. Anyway, I don't know what that has to do with anything, so... <laughs> But we labor. My, my feet have made it possible for me to stand up and preach today. My, my, my hands are very important, but they don't maybe get as a, whole, a lot of attention as other you know, things. that. Uh, and so the, the church is a body. Jesus Christ is our head. And sometimes you'll see things, uh, you know, different ministries more than others. But God in heaven is keeping track. I know sometimes you feel discouraged. You don't get that pat on the back. We all need that sometimes. But don't worry, my friend. If you're doing something and nobody else is watching, I you, the best person in the world and the universe is watching, and that's God. Your labor is valuable. Your labor is beneficial. You Sunday school teachers on a Saturday or Friday or Thursday, or maybe even sometimes Sunday morning, as you prepare your Sunday school message, getting ready for that class, God's keeping track of that, knowing you're teaching some young little boys and young little girls, you pat patch club workers. I could go on and on, all the different ministries. The labor that you're doing, God says, I see it. Keep it up. If you see here again, the beauty of the, the King James Bible, again, is the little things like this that separate this Bible from all the other Bibles. It says, laboreth. Laboreth. It means it's a continual laboring. It means you're just going to be faithful. It's like I said this morning. You go and you do and you go and you do and you go and you do. And you go and you do and you go and you do. And it becomes a beautiful balance. There's another sign for your balance. Does that make sense? Balance. As I said this morning, many of us are like this or like that. There's a beautiful balance there. We laboreth. All right? So number one, God starts with fruits. God knows how to appeal to us. God knows how to dangle the carrot. Forget the carrot. He dangles a cup of ice cream. Somebody say amen right there. He says, there's some fruit right there. There it is. Hold on. Labor a little bit. You labor and you labor and labor. And then number three, we partake. We, all of us together, partake. 
I'm exper- I am partaking in the ministry of somebody's cleaning today. I am partaking in the ministry of the sound. We get to be a partaker of it. And let me encourage you, church, as your pastor gets busy, I believe with all my heart, I believe I can show it to you from the Bible, God blesses this church differently than he does other churches because you are partakers in your pa- external ministries. I believe that wholeheartedly. I believe God says, I'm going to give you blessings that other churches don't experience because of that, because of that labor, because we're all in this thing together. God says you and I can partake and experience and taste the fruits of those labors. Look at verse six again. The husbandman that laboreth must be the first, first, first partaker of the fruits. So we work and we work and we work. We partake, we partake, we partake. We work again and we partake and we work again and we partake. And God says, hey, the fruit's coming. It's still coming. The fruit's there. I got a whole load of fruit. The sad thing is many Christians are missing out on the fruits because they're not laboring. And as a corporate body of church members, as a, as a, as the, look, at, we, we're members of this body. I'm just about through saying that now. We are members of this body. Jesus is the head. As we are all members of this body, the blessing is knowing this, that all of us get to experience and partake of that. You know, my whole body was in Washington, D.C. I didn't send one arm there and another arm stay. No, we all got to experience that. My family experienced those things. We saw it was, it was a corporate family thing. We all got to go and see things and touch things and experience things and come back and share it with you. And many of you have gone. I know we've had family go to Florida and we have family leaving this week for Florida. And one of them says she's not even going to get in the ocean. I'm sorry, I feel a preaching storm. How can you get so close to the ocean and not get in the water? And I'm not talking about putting your little feet in there and like, oh, no, that's, that's girly stuff. I mean, get in there. Let it flood over your head. Let it get in your nose. Salt water in your nose is an awesome feeling, amen? But no, seriously, you partake and you labor. You partake and you labor. Now, let me close with this thought, okay? So God says, hold on a second. I got fruits. I got piles and piles of fruits. All right? And I want to give them to you. And I want you to experience the blessing and the satisfaction and the joy of just saying, wow, I got to be a partake. I got to par- take part or partake of God's work. Yeah. And I'm experiencing the fruits. And then it backs up to verses 1, 2, and 3, where we teach the next generation, hey, Look at my life. Look at these lives. Let me tell you something. We get to be a part of something bigger than us. And then we get to experience the fruits firsthand. This Tuesday, my aunt and uncle, the Braddies, will fly back to America. They'll be in on Tuesday, and they'll be, with, they'll be in America until January, I believe. They're going to travel some and raise some support, and we're excited about that. What do missionaries always say at the end of their letters, right? They always say, thank you for your support. What do they always say? Huh? What? They always say something along the lines of, you have a part in this. That's the principle from the Bible. You don't always have to be right here. The missionaries don't always have to be right here, but boy, when we know we're a part of that ministry there, what a blessing that God in heaven, who is the most organized, detailed being in the universe, he doesn't miss anything. Every time you scrub that toilet, Every time you turned the lights off, every time you locked up the doors one more time, every time you drove that van, every time you drove the bus, every time you played that piano, every time you sang in the choir, God's keeping track. Writing it down. And God has an excellent memory. So tonight I want to encourage you to be that first, first partaker. Heads your bad eyes are closed. Thank you for listening so well this evening. Hello, Pastor Randy Dignan here at Bible Baptist Church. And let me take a moment and thank you for watching the message you just saw. We appreciate so much you supporting our ministry and being engaged with our church's activities. I want to take a few minutes and just talk about what our church really is all about. And that's making sure everybody we come in contact with, whether it's in person at the church or on the streets of our town, or even through the internet like this ministry, knows for sure they're going to heaven someday. You see, tons and tons of people have ideas on how you get to heaven. But it really doesn't matter what you think or what I think, it's what God says. A man named Nicodemus in John chapter 3 asked Jesus a simple question, a question that many of us wanted, a question I wanted for 18 years of my life. 
He asked Jesus about spiritual matters. And before Jesus quotes that famous verse of John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes him should not perish but have everlasting life, he mentions to Nicodemus that the key to getting to heaven, or as he says in John chapter 3, the kingdom of God, is to be born again. What does that mean? Well, simply put, Jesus is simply saying this. Everybody has a physical birthday. You have a birthday, and I have a birthday. But God is a spiritual being. And so you see, if heaven is a spiritual place, and God is a spiritual being, then a spiritual birthday is required to get to heaven someday. You don't get a spiritual birthday by a baptism, although baptism is good. You don't get a spiritual birthday by joining a church, although joining a church is good. You get a spiritual birthday by doing what Jesus says. Not what you think, not what I think. Not what you say, what I say. Jesus tells Nicodemus the same thing he tells you and me today. And that is simply this. Ye must be born again. You see, Jesus Christ is the reason we can be born again today. You see, he came to this earth and for 33 and a half years lived on this planet. And he ministered for three and a half of those years. And then he died on the cross for your sins and my sins. And then three days later, he rose from the dead. And he defeated four enemies that you and I could not defeat. Death, hell, sin, and the devil. And in defeating those four things, you and I now, if we trust in his name for salvation, we are given a spiritual birthday, and then we know for sure we're going to heaven someday. So I've asked you the question today. You have a physical birthday, right? Of course you do. When is your physical birthday? Think about it right now. Now let me ask you a second question. When is your spiritual birthday? You see, I was born physically August 28, 1975. But July 17, 1994, after experiencing multiple baptisms, church memberships, I finally understood more here than here that Jesus Christ is all I needed for salvation. And on July 17, 1994, I gave him my heart. He saved my soul. I trusted his name. He forgave me my sins. And I became a child of God. I was born again. So today, let me ask you, are you born again? If not, please contact our church. We love you, and we want to help you find the same answer we found one time. God is good. Contact us if you need us. God bless, and make it a great day.